Well, good morning. We're already off to a great start. Thank you, Stephen. And woke up this morning to some unexpected rain and the sun breaking through. And just a reminder of God's care, providence over us, which is what we've come to do today, to remember him, to focus on him, and to worship him. So let's begin with worship. Let's stand. Let's sing hymn number 371, Have Thine Own Way, Lord. Would you stand and sing with me? Before returning to your seats, would you join me in reading our shared confession together? We believe in God the Father, infinite in wisdom, goodness, and love, and in Jesus Christ, his Son, our Lord and Savior, who for us and our salvation lived and died and rose again and lives evermore, and in the Holy Spirit, who takes the things of Christ and reveals them to us, renewing, comforting, and inspiring our souls. We are united in striving to know the will of God as taught in the Holy Scriptures and in our purpose to walk in the ways of the Lord, made known or to be made known to us. Amen. Would you say good morning to someone as you're seated?
working? It's working? Yeah. Okay. Good morning. I'm Jim Gates. I'm uh, the chair of our Christian Education Committee under the deacons. Uh, this is Scout Sunday when uh, the troops and the Cub Scout pack uh, observe uh, in their uh, sponsoring uh, institution. And that's why we have the scouts here this morning. There are about half our scouts. And uh, I'd like to, uh, we have uh, John Hinkleman with us, who is this new scout master. He took over from me. He's doing a great job. Uh, Eric Gray is our uh, girls uh, scout master. Uh, the Cub Scouts will be with us uh, this last Sunday in uh, February. At that, I would like to, uh, I think you all know Marlon. He's uh, with our church every uh, Sunday. And uh, he'd like to tell you about his uh, ego project uh, that we did at Sylvan Park uh, yesterday. Hi, thank you. Um, yes, as you may know, yesterday I completed my Eagle Scout project at Sylvan Park. Um, it was a refurbishment of the Elsie Grant Crim Memorial Rose Garden. We planted about 45 roses, which I heard is the largest in recent history. Um, we also fixed some sprinklers. I was very glad to see that many of our scouts came to help me. Um, that was, I was very blessed for that to happen. Also, many of the members of the congregation came. Um, I know Bonnie and uh, Chris came to support me, so thank you very much. Um, and the Redlands Horticultural and Improvement Society, they funded the whole project and really helped me, guide me through the project, so thank you for that, and thank you for everybody who came to support me. We just have two more quick announcements this morning. Uh, most of you have already received your annual giving statements, but just in case you haven't, Ben or I can help you with that this morning. So if you need a printout, we're more than happy to do that for you. You just need to come into the office, not just today, but you can come throughout the week or you can give us a call and we're more than happy to mail it to you as well. And then finally, we've noticed uh, from email and sometimes receiving physical copies that some of you may not be getting your weekly tidying. So if you've had issues with that, whether it's in your email or it's just not coming to your mailbox, could you let Ben or I know so we can make sure that you get those because that's an important part of the life of our church. And it's a way that we communicate to one another what's going on uh, throughout the week and into the weekend. Uh, just as a reminder for children, you can leave after the special music to go to your classes. And then we have our offering basket in the back. You can place those uh, throughout the service, but also you can donate online at redlands.church or bring any offerings into the office today or throughout the week, Monday through Thursday during our office hours. Thank you. Together, all you people worship God with one accord. Sing his praise together, all you people lift your voices to the Lord. Clap your hands, all you people worship God with one accord. Sing his praise together, all you people lift your voices to the Lord. Shout to the Lord, pray forth into song, you people of every nation. Play on your harps and trumpets and horns for God has revealed salvation, salvation. Clap your hands together, all you people worship God with one accord. Sing his praise
Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for this day you have given us. Lord, you are our hope, and your love is immeasurable. Help us to abide in you. We need you. In the chaos and anxiety of our day, teach us to fix our eyes on you, because we need you. In the joys and sorrows that we face, let us proclaim that you are our anchor and fixed point. We proclaim we need you. We say we need you because so often our culture teaches us unending self-sufficiency, rugged and unhealthy independence, working till we drop, pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps, and making an idol of what we do and how we do it. We need the reminder that our lives must be led in and through you, Jesus, your kingdom, your ways, your rhythms of rest and work, your heart, your mind, and your beautiful eternal vision for humanity. We need you. Make us a people of patient endurance, drawn together by the salvation and hope that only you bring. Help us to see the needs and brokenness of those around us. Help us to love others as you have loved us. Make us a people known for our love. For the fracturing and brokenness in our world, where violence and dehumanization still stings, please bring your shalom. Please bring your sense of wholeness and peace. We need you. And Lord, for the spoken and unspoken prayer requests that are in our minds right now, we bring them before you, the perfect and attentive listener. We seek your kingdom to come and your will to be done. This morning, Lord, we just want to take a moment in silence before you to pray for the people and things that have pop popped up in our minds this morning. So just as a congregation, we'll take a, a minute of silence to pray. Would you join me in praying the prayer Jesus taught his disciples? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
But our scripture this morning is from Psalm 3, which is on page 841 and 842 in your pew Bibles, where you can follow along in the Bible or up on the screens to my left and right. Psalm 3 is a psalm of David when he fled from his son Absalom. Lord, how many are my foes? How many rise up against me? Many are saying of me, God will not deliver him. But you, Lord, are a shield around me, my glory, the one who lifts my head high. I call out to the Lord, and he answers me from his holy mountain. I lie down and sleep. I wake again because the Lord sustains me. I will not fear, though tens of thousands assail me on every side. Arise, Lord, deliver me, my God. Strike all my enemies on the jaw. Break the teeth of the wicked. From the Lord comes deliverance. May your blessing be on your people. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. Nothing like taking the pulpit after uh, asking God to break a jaw and knock out teeth. It's like, oh, I got my work cut out for me. This is, if you didn't guess already, this is what's commonly referred to as a psalm of lament. It's a very common category of psalm where the psalmist names the broken parts either of the world in him or herself or interpersonally. And this I think you see all three in this particular psalm. It's a psalm where it is perhaps most clearly a prayer because a lament is rooted in a sense of helplessness. I can't fix this. All I can do is name the broken parts of the world and offer it to the living God. It's the psalmist stands and bears witness to the brokenness of this world in the one hand, while also looking at God and saying, if this breaks my heart, what must it do to your heart? It is a psalm of seeking God's intervention while also releasing and saying, I cannot fix these things. I've tried. I cannot fix them. Have you ever felt completely helpless and hopeless after reading a newspaper? <laughs> I know I have, from all the problems we face in the world, from poverty to war, to drug abuse, alcohol abuse, pandemics, hope, homelessness, the political divide in our country, racism's persistence, sexism's persistence, social media, anxiety among our children, Anxiety among ourselves. I mean, even as I list those things, what is it doing inside of you? Are you thinking like, John, I've come here to not think about those things. Well, lament is when we think about those things. When we face what we don't want to face. When we look at just how deep and profound these problems are, how embedded they are, how nobody has a solution to these problems. A prayer of lament is often the most deeply felt prayer because it's a place where our own brokenness comes to God in prayer. Brokenness at our frustration within, at our inability to get things right. Frustration at the world as it is knowing God is good. How can God tolerate wrongdoing? Why? God, do you tolerate the treacherous, those who intend harm for good people? Why do you stand silent against injustice when the wicked swallow up? You know what? I'm just going to read a lament. This is another one. This is from Habakkuk. This is what Habakkuk says to God. Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. Why then? Do you tolerate the treacherous? Why are you silent while the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves? At the core of a lament is the question of why. Why 
is there's so much evil when we worship a God who is so good? Why do we live in such a broken time and age when Jesus himself said, the kingdom of God is here, it's at hand, it's all around you? Lamenting is when we give voice to those broken areas. And the good news, because I can tell you're already ready for some good news, is the point of a lament is to find peace. At the core of a lament is a trust in the goodness of God and the sense that God will vindicate those who are righteous. This is a Psalm of David. This comes while he is in exile. He's been king. He's been king for a while. Then his son Absalom sexually assaults his half-sister, David's daughter, and then seizes control of the monarchy, sending David into exile. He had been spending years undermining David's authority, his reputation. He would sit at the city gate as people came in and say, what are you here for? Well, I've come to seek king, the king's counsel in this matter. And Absalom would say, good luck with that. He is slow to respond. He will not listen. You will find that your arrival, you're seeking an audience with the king, that you should have just stayed home and not wasted your time here. And slowly, over time, Absalom undermining him, portraying him as a man of all talk and no action, as someone too busy to manage his own household, let alone the country. David finally flees his own son, betraying him, a coup, and him escaping to the wilderness. And you can feel in this psalm of his the despair, the hopelessness. He is hiding from a people that want to kill him and solidify Absalom's claim to the throne. He is outnumbered 10,000 to one. Yeah. At least that's how he feels. He's outnumbered 10,000 to one. His enemies spreading lies, undermining his rule. Uh, he is the anointed king of Israel. And yet here he is, back in the wilderness, back at the caves he knows all too well because of the years he spent hiding from Saul, reliving those desert years as his own son seeks to kill him. So he prays. He names his fears, he laments. In his confusion, his despair, his hopelessness, he brings it all and places it into God's hands. And as you were reading through that psalm, I, I, I wonder, what do you think David felt after he finished this psalm, after he finished this prayer, after surrendering all his fears and anxiety into God's hands? Did he... Does fear melt away? Did he go in, in despair and fear after a sleepless night? And after praying, did he sigh? Did he feel his shoulders go down? <sighs> did he open his eyes and smile? Did he stand up, brush off his knees, and then just go back to living? I think when he finished this prayer of lament, what he was left with was peace. You know you have lamented well when what you experience afterwards is peace, calm, a release of all that you were carrying. It is like taking off a 50-pound backpack and saying to God, you carry this. I can't carry this anymore. It's too heavy for me. Um, the whole point of a lament is to give it to God and then to trust him. It's so not to hold it, not to, if you, if you leave just as anxious and angry as you, you began, go right on back there and try it again. Because the whole point of a lament, of giving a voice, giving it a name, is to give it into God's hands. To turn your anxiety, your anger, your fear, your sense of pain, your hurt, to give it to the living God and let him carry it to give your thoughts and prayers to him. And then 
release it. Because guess what? If you're praying about something that is true, God cares about it more than you do. That he feels it deeper than you do. And what we are doing in a lament is naming something, aligning it with God, surrendering it to him so that we can go back and live well. So how do you get there? How do you get there? How can we be a formed and shaped people that are able to lament? He has three moves. Move one, my life is in God's hands. Move two, he will sustain and protect me. Move three, he who brought me into the world, he who sustains me in the end will vindicate the righteous. You can see a move from the past into the present and then from the present into the future. Let's break it down. Verse five, I lie down and sleep. I wake again because the Lord sustains me. Think about how vulnerable you are when you sleep. You are unconscious. Um, you are, in, when Jesus spoke of Lazarus, after he received word that, that Lazarus had died, he said to his disciples, he's not dead, he's asleep. And his disciples said, well, if he's sick and sleeping, we should just let him be. But what Jesus was talking about was referring to sleep as, as death as, a, as sleep. Uh, because he was about to go wake him up. And I don't think David was thinking of sleep as a little death in his psalm. But there is something about sleep that feels like a surrendering of ourselves, of a giving in to sleep, where our body lies still. We remain unconscious until we wake. Somebody once said, sleep is a time machine that takes us to breakfast. I like that idea, uh, <laughs> mostly because it is indeed my favorite meal of the day. But what, Saul, what David is saying is when every night when I surrender to sleep, God wakes me up. God, who brought me through one day, wakes me up as I enter into a new day. And I find in waking gratitude. I find when I wake, the, well, David says this, I find when I wake into a new day, it's a promise that God, who took me through another night, will take me through another day. David begins by looking backwards, by looking at God's sovereignty, his care, his love, that God, that we are fearfully, wonderfully made, that God has knit us together in our mother's womb, that God has brought us into the world for a purpose, a reason, for love. So he begins with a lament by saying, God has good to me. God woke me up. God brought me into a new day. So the first part of his lament is centering on and grounding because sometimes when we're in despair, we forget to look for God's blessings and God's goodness. So it begins with a grounded rootedness and I know God is real and that he loves me because I'm praying right now. He woke me up, called me into another day to sustain me. Verse six, I will not fear, though tens of thousands assail me on every side. This is the lament portion. This is where you begin with God has brought me into a new day. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I'm knit together in the womb by the hand of our loving Father. But I'm in danger. But people are speaking ill of me. I'm anxious, I'm unable to sleep, my heart is broken, I'm despairing, I'm angry. This is when you move into giving name, giving voice to what it is that unsettles us. It says there's people, powers, forces seeking to destroy me, to discourage me, to distort my life, my motivations, who grasp for power, control, who want me out of the way, who want me killed. I know God, that you love me and care for me. I know from you that I have dignity and honor, but these people want to destroy me. They are violent, they are greedy, they have power, they're coordinated, they're unified in their hatred of me, and I don't know what to do. I'm the king of Israel, and I'm hiding in a cave. 
I don't know how to hold on the one hand God's love of me, and on the other hand, I'm in a cave scared for my life. How do I, how do I hold these together? If you love me, then why are they trying to kill me? Why are things so hard? If I'm anointed king, if you woke me up and called me into this new day, why'd you call me into a day where people are seeking actively to destroy me? God wakes me, God sustains me, and now I name what it is that's broken and then trust in God's vindication, verse seven and eight. Don't pray verses seven and eight until you've prayed the first few. That's my one advice right now. Don't go straight to the broken jaws and the broken teeth part. First, <laughs> ground yourself in God's love for you. Ground yourselves in, in naming and giving voice to what's broken in the world. Then you can pray this part. Verse seven and eight. Arise, Lord, deliver me, my God. Strike all my enemies on the jaw. Break the teeth from the wicked. From the Lord comes deliverance. May your blessing be on your people. This image of breaking a jaw and knocking teeth out, it's an image of stopping those who intend to do harm and robbing him of the capacity to do that harm. He doesn't just say, kill them. What he says is, thwart their plans, stop them from what they're doing, take away the jaws that speak lies, the teeth that seek to bite and devour. If you think of a predator that's trying to devour a victim, breaking the teeth and the, and the jaw rendered the predator useless. What David is saying is take away the power of those who intend evil. Remove them from their positions of power. Thwart their plans. Remember your people. Rescue and deliver us. You woke me up today into a world full of those who wish to do harm to those who are righteous. So thwart their plans so that the righteous can live and, and use their mouths to praise you. Think about the emotional journey of each move. You, you brought me into this life. It's not random. It's not without purpose. You woke me up for a reason. Therefore, as I name the broken places, what my anxieties, my fears, my anger, knowing that I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, that the God who created me, who brought me into this world, will sustain us. You are not an accident, even though some of you have, may have been told by your parents you were an accident. To God, nobody, none of us are accidents. People make mistakes. God does not. So that first move is when we breathe in God's grace Feel the peace come to us, saying all that is wrong and broken is distorting what I know to be true, which I am fearfully, wonderfully made. I am loved. So he's grounded in that sense of peace and calm. Then he moves to the present, but right now I'm surrounded by enemies. There are people who wish to do harm to me. There are people right now saying terrible things about me, spreading lies, planning and scheming to bring me down. I can't stop them. And, and as we lament, as I'm sure David wrote this psalm, he's th he has faces in his mind. He has people that he's thinking of, enemies that wish to destroy him. He's scared, but he's scared for a good reason. You know, it's, was it Woody, Woody Allen said, just because I'm paranoid doesn't mean people aren't after me. You know, that, that idea of, uh, I'm not paranoid here. People are, are trying to kill me and destroy me. And, and he moves from the, the comfort of the past and God's care to the anxiety of the moment into a future promise of God's peace. You will vindicate. In the end, all will be made well. And if all is not well yet, then we are not yet at the end. For in the end, God will always have the final word. God who holds the beginning is the God who holds the end which is the God that can be trusted in all of the middle parts. Um, that the middle right now may be full of pain, confusion, people who have done awful things to us, but in the end, all will be made well for those who are faithful. Um, think about every movie ever. I was thinking about in this psalm, basically follows the three-act structure 
of any movie you watch. You know, you act one, you meet the characters, they're charming, they're delightful, they're destined for each other. Step two, conflict. They're missing each other. There's a misunderstanding. Will they or won't they get together? Step three, resolved. Or step phase one, everything great in Pandora. Second act, we need to, to flee and learn the way of the water. Act three, resolution. If you've seen Avatar, the new one, the, the resolution's a little bit incomplete there. It's not as complete as what we see pictured in scripture. Uh, any any three-act movie follows the same pattern that we see here. We're in the second act right now. We're in the parts where we are experiencing pain and seeking re resolution. So my prayer for us is that we will learn to, to lament, knowing that God who brought you into the world, who brought you here, will sustain you. And in the end, all will be made well. May you find peace as we learn how to lament together. And before standing to, to sing one final hymn, I wanna pray Psalm 3 over us. So let's pray. Lord, how many are our foes who rise up against us saying God will not deliver us. But you, Lord, are a shield around us. My glory, you are the one who lifts our head. May we call out to you and may you answer us from your holy mountain. We lie down and sleep and wake up again because you sustain us. We will not fear tens of thousands who assail us on every side. Arise, Lord, deliver us. Strike all our enemies on the jaw. Break the teeth of the wicked. From you comes deliverance. May your blessing be on us, your people. Amen. Would you stand and sing with me hymn number 294, Set My Soul Afire.
Today's benediction is from Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, may you clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. May you bear with each other and forgive each other if any of you has a grievance. Forgive just as the Lord forgave you. And may you over all these virtues put on love, which binds them together in perfect unity. Amen.